Welcome to Arcade Attack. A retro gaming podcast for up to four players. Hello, it's Adrian here from Arcade Attack, and on today's show, I'm joined by Nathan McCree. He composed the music for the first three Tomb Raider games. He also worked on Soul Star, Silent Hill Downpour, and many, many more. He also talks about his time working with the Spice Girls, so sit back and enjoy a really interesting and in-depth interview with the music legend himself. So Nathan, it really is a pleasure to have you on the Arcade Attack podcast. You know, thank you so much for your time today. It is much appreciated. You're very welcome. Good, good to talk. Nice one. I'd, I'd love to start from the beginning, actually, uh, about how. What's your earliest memories of music, and uh, and also maybe video gaming, and how the two worlds kind of collided? What What are the two big memories for you growing up? Um, you know, my earliest memory. I think the music was probably, uh, you know, riding in my dad's car, going to the pub on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, and he he was quite a fan of the Carpenters. I don't know whether you know of them. Yeah, yeah, I like them. Yeah. So um, he he used to always sing along to the Carpenters, and of course we'd all do it as well. Me and my brother, and my sister, and my mum. And dad would always come out with these like. Uh, like amazing harmonies that weren't part of the actual track itself. They come up with like new harmonies, singing along, you know. And I always thought that that was really fascinating. It was amazing. So I guess that was kind of mm. from a very early stage got 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 me the sort of bug into you know inventing stuff. Good stuff. I guess you know I used, to, I used to sing along and invent lines as well. You know it was it was part of the fun. So there was that. I mean. What was the second part of your question? It was about um, yeah, and, and maybe help. With... Yeah, video games as well. Obviously, the two well, they're, they're different industries, but obviously they, they interlink. But what was your earliest memories of video games? Uh, um, probably, probably the ZX eighty one that I yeah. got. Um, I bought a, ZX, a Sinclair ZX eighty one when I was about eleven. Um, and me and my brother used to program that, you know, from, you know, listings in magazines. Oh, they did it then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listing in a magazine, you literally have to sit there and type type it in, line for line. And when and if you, you know, if you made any mistakes, it, it didn't work. So, yeah, we used to spend hours doing that. And then, of course, you just get a little block, a black <laughs> block graphic moving around the screen. And that was it. And it took you about four hours to program it all in. So, um, yeah, I remember programming in a game called Jaws. Nice. Which took ages. Yeah, and it was just two black dots around the screen. One one of them chased you, and the other one, you were the swimmer, and you had to sort of swim away from it. That was it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, was there a point in your life when you thought, I love games, I assume you're a big gamer, and you're into your music, obviously. Was there a time when you thought, I can actually put these two together, maybe? Um... No, it didn't really sort of work like that. Um, 
I got into uh, I sort of got into games and music really at the same time. There was sort of two things which I enjoyed doing. Yeah. Um, I, but my, my my heart was really in the music. You know, yeah. I, I wanted to leave school at 16 and be in a rock band, you know, and yeah. tour the world. That's what I wanted to do. And um, my dad wasn't having any of that. He said I had to get my <laughs> levels and go to university, you know. Yeah. So I didn't know bloody hell. So I, qu- I had to quit the band that I was in. I went down to London to university and um, studied computer programming. Okay. And I sort of forgot really about games i didn't really you know i didn't have a console when i was at university um i just had a, a, an atari st which which i used for basically music programming and and doing my university assignments on so i wasn't really playing games i didn't really have time for it i guess when i was at university and then um you know i left and i was just looking for a programming job and it was just purely by chance that I stumbled across Core, yeah. and um, yeah, took a programming job with them. But I had I had no idea they were a games company. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Core back then was probably I, I assume quite a small company, was it? Or uh, yeah, there was about um, I don't know, thirty people, I think, when I joined. And by the time I left, there was about sixty. Oh, fair enough. What was your first? So, what was your first? Few days working in the industry, but was it? It wasn't music straight away. Is that right? It was game testing. It was programming. Is that right? It was. It was programming, not testing. Okay, no, sorry. Yeah. Pro- programming. Um, my first assignment was to program a music sequencer for the Mega Drive. Oh, nice. I was working with another guy, Sean, on that. He was doing the machine code, you know, the assembly language, and I was doing the C programming in C so I was doing all the sort of front end and the, the user interface and he did all the sort of background yeah. engine for it um, yeah we worked on that for about four months and then we finished it a little bit ahead of time so I said to Jeremy our boss I just said look I'll, why don't I write a piece of music on it and show you what it can do so I did that and he just liked the music and said you know do you want to do the music for our next game I'm like okay <laughs> brilliant what, what was the next game if you don't mind me asking it was um, Asterix and the Great Rescue. Oh, brilliant. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you, you went into the programming, but was music always your main sort of love then, would you say? Is that a fair thing to say? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Over, over computer programming, most definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can see why you jumped to the chance then. Um, I'm going to talk about some particular games uh, a little bit later, but is there a particular soundtrack or piece of music for any any of the games you've ever worked on you're just most proud of and can you kind of explain why? If you could use one. Uh, uh, games that I've worked on. <clears throat> um, it's a tricky one. It is a tough question. Um, yeah, because I, you know, I like them all for different reasons. Um, well, I don't like them all. <laughs> but most of them. Um, I don't know, I'm probably... I'm probably quite proud of Soulstar because yeah. it, it wasn't my first orchestral score for Core Design, mm. but it was certainly, I don't know, the second or mm. third, um, but it was certainly the biggest in yeah. terms of sort of produ- production and production sort of sound. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we 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 got we got a nomination award for that best computer game music of the year. We didn't win it, but we got nominated. The game that won it was Rebel Assault, and they used the John Williams Star Wars music from the movies. It was like, like you know, a bit difficult to compete against that. Yeah, that's not. But, yeah. I thought I was in the same category as that. I just thought, well, you know, that's pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so yeah, that was that was quite a big challenge. Um, and the the synthesizers I had at the time weren't really geared up for doing orchestral scores, so you know a lot of the brass sounds in there were basically just saw waves, just you know literally synthetic sounds. Yeah. So yeah, I had to sort of disguise it and bury it, and 
yeah, in the end result wasn't wasn't too bad. I think I was quite pleased with that. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, I'd love to know actually. I know I appreciate things have changed in gaming over the last few years and whatnot, but. What's a typical day like for you, maybe back in the day, like the old days of 16 or 32-bit gaming, of writing a piece of music, and how long does it take you typically to start and complete a track for a game? Well, I I write about, on average, about a minute per day. Okay. It depends on the complexity of the score. You know, if it's a big orchestral score, it can take longer. It can take a day and a half, or sometimes even two days a minute. But not normally, <clears throat> somewhere about a minute a day. Um, but there's other games where, you know, the deadline has been really, really tight and I've had to write an album in a week. Really? Yeah, you know, like 10 tracks, three minutes each sort of thing in a week. Ah, it's hard work. But, you know, it's doable. Um, you don't sleep very much. Yeah. A typical day with when I'm when I'm writing music, mm. okay. Um, I get up pretty early because my kids get up early, breakfast, all that kind of thing. Get them off to school, and then I come into the studio, cup of coffee. I will. I usually um, like experiment with ideas in the morning, and then in the afternoon, I tend to polish those ideas. Yeah. And then, you know, if, again, if, if I'm working hard on something, I'll work evenings as well mm. and into the early hours of the morning. And that's usually where I guess I do my most creative stuff. Um, because, you, you you know, you're in a sort of semi-dream state late yeah. at night. And that can often help you sort of think outside the box a little bit and do things that you wouldn't normally do. So I think a lot of people are mostly creative in the early hours of the morning. Um, you know, and if I'm doing that, if I'm writing music, that's all I do. I just I just write all day long. Um, I find it very difficult to leave it alone. You know, you sort of get addicted to a track. Can't wait to hear it again. You know, you can't stop thinking about it. It's going around in your head at lunchtime. You know, you're thinking of the next line you're going to put down or yeah. where it's going to go. You know, it's totally absorbing. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, often I find I don't shave when I'm writing a track. <laughs> you've got and a good, a, a good beard. When I shave, and it's like, right, okay, that's that one done. On to the next one, you know. I don't know. It's just a little sort of silly habit I've got into. All right. So if, um, you've, if, if you've got a big beard, then maybe you've gone through a bit of a... Uh, well, the, the track never lasts more than about three or four days, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. It's not too bad, but you know, if it starts getting itchy on my neck, I know that I've spent too long on a track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, you, do you use a lot of instruments, or is it all computer based, or do you put, get a guitar, or is it piano, or is it anything? Is it literally just software, or? Um, no, I have real instruments as well. I play the guitar. Mm. I play lots of rhythm percussion instruments. Um, I sing as well. Nice. Um, I have lots of sort of. Where is it? You know, little funny instruments like this. Oh, nice. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Just the things that just make weird sounds. And um, and then, you know, my keyboard racks. I mean, they're filled with hundreds of orchestral sounds. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I sort of pick from those mostly. But, you know, it, it depends on the music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. You know, if it's an orchestral score, I won't be sat there playing my guitar. Mm. You know. no, fair enough. Um, how much sort of freedom are you given when you're given these scores or the games? Is it up to you, or are you given quite a lot of um, sort of guidance, or is it completely in your hands? Again, just depends on the client who I'm working for. Um, yeah. Sometimes they give you a hundred percent free reign. They just say, we need some music, do whatever you want. Yeah. Other times they're really specific and, and other times they're really confusing. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I, I had this one brief, it, it was, we want some tribal music, but not tribal. Yep. <laughs> right. uh, okay. That you know, doesn't it, make sense. 
So, you know, half the battle is actually trying to understand the client and what yeah. what's in their head. And that's the kind of biggest challenge when you start a project because they, they've they got an idea in their head, but because they're not musical, they can't describe it to you. Yeah. So, you know, you do a lot of sort of fact finding to begin with, you know, playing them reference music saying is it like this mm-hmm. is this your idea is it like that you know do you want it more like this more like that you know you're trying to sort of narrow in the goalposts so that um by the time i start writing you hope that you sort of hit the mark straight away um you know if you don't then it's just it can be days wasted even yeah. weeks sometimes you know if you're not if you don't get in, you know, if you're not on track. Yeah. You know? um, so, yeah, it just depends on the client, really. Oh, fair um, enough. Fair enough. Um, how about your inspirations when you, when you work on video game music? Obviously, I know you've got a brief, but is there what sort of other medias or music inspires you when you when you work on, on, on your particular projects? Um. Well, yeah, when I work on games, most of the sort of inspiration, if you like, um, comes from, you know, understanding the story of what happens, knowing about the characters, the environment that they're in, you know. So, you know, most of the inspiration comes from the game itself. Um, You know, every, every composer, I'm sure, you know, has their influences yeah. from everything else that they listen to. So, you know, quite often you'll be writing something and you think, oh, you know, I swear I've heard that before or somewhere. <laughs> and then you discover what it is and it's like, shit, it's <laughs> that. You know, oh, I've got to change it now. Yeah. You know? So that that can often happen. Um, so I, th- I think you, you you're constantly trying to find something new. You're constantly trying to find patterns and melodies that you've never heard before. Um, And that can take some time sometimes. So, yeah, you know, my influences come from everything I listen to, films, pop music, you know, whatever. Um, You know, so I I try not to let those things influence me too much because, you know, you can easily end up sounding like somebody else. And... Again, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to sound like me. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. you know, it it can be it can be frustrating sometimes when a client says we want this kind of music and they're very specific about that. Yeah, you know that can be a bit frustrating. I think for any composer or any artist because it's like you're being told what to create and that you know that that. that you're not really creating then, you're just copying, Mm. you know. Um, So, you know, I don't don't like the brief to be too strict. I like there to be a little bit of room for me to discover something new for that project that's never been heard before. And I think really that makes for a stronger uh, product because, you know, you've then invented some new IP, which... You know, music tends to kind of glue everything together as well. So, um, you know, if you if you can find a new sound musically, yeah. and then that gels the whole project together, you know, you've got a very strong combination. Um, you know, it's 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 a new bit of music which hopefully people will remember, not necessarily just because of its melody, but because of its sound. Yeah. You know? So yeah, I don't like to sound like too many other people. So you know, I try I try not to listen to anything too specific when I'm working on something. I tend to just sort of lock myself away and and let my you know my brain do what it does and yeah, try try and be as free as possible. Oh, good stuff. No, really good answer. Um, we are big fans of Tomb Raider here at Arcade Attack. I mean, t- right. Tomb Raider is a huge, a huge franchise. It's absolutely amazing. And yeah. you've, you've obviously worked, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the first three Tomb Raider games. I mean, yeah. they are huge. They are massive. They, they, you can almost argue they changed gaming in a way. I mean, how exactly did, did this opportunity first arrive for you to work on Tomb Raider? 
Well, I was uh, I was already working at Core. I'd been there since 1993. Yeah. Um, there was me and another musician, uh, a guy called Martin Iveson, and he was taking care of mostly Amiga projects when I first arrived, and I took care of the Mega Drive stuff. Yeah. And then when the CD consoles came in in 94, yeah. um, we were sort of both doing CD stuff. Um, but his style of writing was very different to mine. He, he was much more into rhythm-based music. You know, I used to call him the human drum machine. His <laughs> rhythm was just impeccable. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so he was really good at that sort of stuff. And I, my, my rhythm has never been my strong point. I've always been sort of weighted on the melody and harmony yeah. side of things. So I sort of naturally started doing more of the orchestral stuff, and Martin did more of the sort of, you know, break beats and, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And so... Like I say, I'd done Heimdall and then uh, Soulstar and then Swagman came along yeah. and then Tomb Raider. Yeah. And so for me, it was just like another project. Yeah. Um, it automatically just came to me because Toby said he wanted some orchestral music. So I was like, okay, well, then Nathan does it. Um, so he came to my room, just started talking to me about it. And yeah, you know. The next day I was writing some music for it. Um, but it wasn't, you know, none of us had any idea what, what yeah. you know, how it was going to be. We didn't really know what we were making, most of us. Yeah. You know, it was just a sort of bubbling pot of ideas and everyone was sort of chucking stuff in. It was like, oh, do you think Lara could do this? And someone would go, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. we'll do that. And by the afternoon she was doing it, you know. So it sort of just... You know, morphed. Morphed, yeah. Um, but you, as we went, as we went forward, so yeah, there was, there was nothing really sort of planned in there to sort of. You know, um, I mean, to, yeah, to sort of hit the big time. No, no, none of us had any idea about that. I mean, it, was it a shock then how successful Tomb Raider was then? Because it, it it was one of the biggest like PlayStation and Saturn games released, I believe, and PC games at the time. Well, you know, and I, th- I think. You know, maybe maybe some of the people were shocked by that, but I, it never really sort of hit me like that. Yeah. You know, when I was when I started work, there, I was just so chuffed to be fully employed writing music. Okay. It was just like a dream job, you know? and all I was interested in was what the magazines were saying about my music. Right. So whatever game I worked on. Once it was released, I'd be looking at the magazines and going, have they reviewed it? Have they reviewed it? Yeah, yeah, here's a review. And then I'd read, 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 and I'd be searching for them saying something about the music. Most yeah. of the time, they just wouldn't talk about the music and sound yeah. at all, which was really annoying. But every now and again, somebody would mention the music, and you'd get a score, you know, something out of 10 or whatever. <clears throat> and most of the time, most of my reviews, I was getting 9 out of 10 and 10 out of 10. Yeah. So I was just like... Every time one of those came in, I was just chuffed to bits. Yeah, yeah of it, course. It, you know, it didn't matter what game it was or how good the game was doing or how well it was selling. I only cared about my my score because that was well, that was you your know, job, wasn't it? Yeah. To me, hmm. yeah. So, you know, Tomb Raider did really, really well, and and um, you know, and then we we decided to do Tomb Raider two. Hmm. Um, but you know we've done sequels before. We had Chuck Rock and then Chuck Rock Two. Yeah, um, and, I, and I'm sure there are others. Um, so it wasn't, you know, what I mean, it didn't seem like an unusual thing to happen. It just seemed like, oh, okay, great, it was a success, so let's do another one. Fair enough. Um, it probably wasn't until after Two Made It Two that mm. I, I think, personally realised that yeah, it, it was it was really massive. I mean, it helped because our boss turned up in a Ferrari and we lay him. So it was like, oh yeah, it must be doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I mean, I assume you, as you're working at Core, you had a lot of freedom working on the Tomb Raider soundtrack. It, you could, were, you up, were you allowed to do whatever you wanted for that? Or, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. 
you know, I was just in charge of whatever I did. Um, I mean, I still, I, I still run everything past Jeremy and said, you know, come and listen to the latest tune, and he'd come down and listen, and yeah. he'd either say it was shit or he'd say it was brilliant, <laughs> and then he'd go again, you know. Um, I didn't really take much notice because I felt that what I was doing was good anyway, yeah. and he, he didn't bother me. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't say, you know, no, you've got to do it like this or anything like that. Not at all. Um, he just let us get on with it. Good stuff. I, I, so, I, 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 just talking to you now, I get the feeling that Core was a good place to work, a nice atmosphere. You allowed to get on with the work. Is that a fair assumption? There were there were many things that were really good about it. Yeah. Many things. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you know, but it, it was it was a relatively small building yeah. with you know forty fifty lads in there. Um, you know, we all worked bloody hard. Most of us were working nights every single day, yeah. weekends as well. You know, well, you know, when you got a like a bunch of single lads in there, it's like, well, <laughs> why? Why go home? What's the point? Yeah. Might as well just stay here and have a laugh with your mates. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like that. And oh, and by the way, we'll just make this cool game as well while we're doing it. So we'd have pizza in every night and beers and yeah, that sounds pretty know, good. <laughs> just, we all just all just sort of lived together. We all went out together. Went out drinking together. We went round to each other's houses. You know, a big big group of us. Um, so it didn't really feel like work. Mm. Um. So yeah, yeah, they were, they, it, it was quite a close knit sort of family thing, yeah, and it and it was good for for those reasons. Um, but <clears throat> you know, stress levels got high many many times, and people would you know have difficulty. Fair enough. <laughs> and there were you know, and there were lots of arguments. Yeah, and people shouting at each other and all sorts of things. So yeah, it was a sort of um, a volatile situation, um, but. Yeah, you know, Je- Jeremy was, um, again, you know, a good boss in many ways. Um, but he was a, he was a hard businessman as well. And, you know, when, when he said jump, we had to jump. Yeah. And, and many times, you know, it was, it was difficult. Yeah. Difficult. You know, if you've made plans for the weekend, <laughs> but he didn't care about that. Oh, really? If he wanted something out on Monday, it was like, you stay there and get it done. Or you know where the door is. Wow. That was his catchphrase. You know where the fucking door is. <laughs> Excuse me for swearing, but that's exactly that's right. what he used to say. If you did, if you weren't happy, you lose your job. Blimey. Like, great. You know, so, I mean... <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it wasn't all good. There were, there were some difficult times. Yeah. But, you know, I think we all respected him. He, you know, he, he got the job done in the, in the end. No, um, that's fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's very different back then. I bet it was. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think you'd get away with it now. Well, um, yeah, there's there's big big news, isn't it, about the amount of work people have been put into Red Dead Redemption Two and working stupid hours, and it was almost like a boast. It seemed like from Rockstar, and it got a bit of flack actually about pushing workers too hard. And would you kind of agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, and none of those guys got. Um, as far as I'm aware, get overtime. Pay. Yeah. You yeah. might get a bonus at the end of the project, but yeah, but you've, you've got a life outside of games as well. I think that's fair, isn't it? Well, well, this is the thing, you know. You know, when when I started out, like I say, and you're all in your sort of early to mid twenties, it doesn't really matter because you don't have another life no. outside of your work. What have you got? Going down the pub with the people that you work. <laughs> so you know that's your other life. Um, it's not really until, until you start sort of settling down with, you know, serious girlfriends and, you know, having kids and that kind of thing, but then it really does become a problem. Um, but, you know, when you're young, it's like, we didn't really care that we were working late at yeah. weekends, like I say. It, did, it didn't matter because it was good fun. Yeah. But I wouldn't do that now. No, that's understandable. You know, I, only, I only do that now if I, if I really, really have to, for some reason, or if I'm doing somebody a favour. But you know, I, I just can't because you know, I've got wife and five kids. No, I, they keep you busy. I'm, I've got, I've got three kids. That's <laughs> yeah, they do they keep do. you busy. You know. 
I'd love to talk about Lara Croft. I mean, a really interesting character and um, a slightly polarising character, but I personally think that she, she, you know, obviously she doesn't exist, but she kind of helped uh, pave the way for future female protagonists and, and, and stars of video games. And do you, have a, do you have a personal view on Lara as a character, as a, as a game character? Do you think she's really important? Or do you, do you have not many... What's your opinion? Um, well, I think it was... I think it was a good thing yeah. that it happened because it did basically open up the games industry to female gamers. Um, because before Lara Croft, it was really mostly, you know, yeah. 14 to 17 year old boys. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it wasn't cool to be a girl gamer, but after, you know, the Spice Girls came out and then, you know, Lara Croft came out, girl power was in and yeah. suddenly it was really cool and and you know I, I guess we were the first people to sort of tap into that market yeah. um, and I think that's why the game sold really well because suddenly we were selling to twice as many people yeah as before so yeah it was a good thing that it happened um, it's good that we've got girl gamers now and it's and it's good because it's um, introduced um more females into the industry, you know, as part of the workforce, which also I think is great. You know, um, we didn't have too many at Core Design. I think we only had sort of two or three girls working there, but, you know, one in particular, Heather, who was the level designer on Tomb Raider. I mean, she was brilliant. Brilliant at her job, brilliant to work with, really good laugh, and one of the lads, you know. Yeah. She'd come out with us and, you know, we'll have a great time together. And I still see Heather. You know, she's, she's really good fun. Great person to work with. Yeah, good, good on you. Nice, good answer. Um, out of all the three, the first three Tomb Raider games, do you have a personal favourite regarding the music and overall game? Is there a particular soundtrack in any of those three you think is, is the best? I personally like Tomb Raider 2 yeah. because the, the controls were improved from Tomb Raider 1. Yeah. So it, it was more fluid. Um, and you know, I played it on a on a PC, and on that version, you could save at any point, and that was really helpful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that that was good for me. Um, and I personally like the controls of, you know, WASD and a mouse. I like I like that control mechanism. Yeah, better is. than a joypad on PlayStation, for instance. Yeah, I, I agree actually completely. Yeah. yeah, I think with, with any first, well, I know it's not a first-person game, but with any game where you can look mm. look around, you know, with your character, and I think a mouse is a better controller for that than than a joypad. So um, I thought it lent itself better to a mouse. Um, so I like Tomb Raider 2 on, uh, on the PC. And the, the soundtrack for me was was better. Yeah. Um, I, I had more control over it on number two. On number one, I wrote the music, but I didn't put it in. I think Toby put in all the music triggers, and it was far from perfect. Okay. Um, but two made two. I did all the triggering myself, and yeah, it was much better. It, it had logic controls on the on the triggers as well, so you know you couldn't keep running over the same square. And, Starting the tune over and over again. It, oh, yeah. it was like, oh no, you've already you've already started this tune. We're going to leave it running until it finishes. Yeah. You know, so there was logic to sort of test um, to make sure that users couldn't break it like that. Um, so yeah, it just it just worked better as a soundtrack. Um, and I think you know I was starting to develop that sort of. Well, I it's not really an interactive soundtrack, but um, how I was using the tunes and where they were used and how they were being triggered was was better. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. So I, I would say that. No, 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 number three for me was a bit too. Uh, it, it was a bit too fragmented for me, and I. And I I wasn't a huge fan of the brass sounds on the 
JV 1080s. And that sort of grated on me a bit. Um, yeah, so I, I, I didn't enjoy that so much. Fair enough. There you go. It's my long answer. To that. That's a good answer. I mean, I I, I listened to the, the the just before this interview. I listened to the soundtrack of the first Tomb Raider game. And I really, you know, it's brilliant. It's brought back so many memories for me, and um, it kind of reminded me a little bit like some some sort of Zelda sounds as well, some Zelda soundtracks. And uh, would you? I mean, was there any big inspiration for the, for Tomb Raider? Is there any sort of films or games that kind of helped you? Do you think at all, or or do you think that's? I mean, me talking about Zelda. I don't know if that's completely fair, but. Well, well, I've never played Zelda, so definitely not Zelda. <laughs> there you go. Uh, no, I, you know, I think if anything, my inspiration for Tomb Raider probably came from movies. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it came from games because it, you know, the whole thing about Tomb Raider was that I wanted to add, you know, emotional content into mm. games, which, yeah. I, as far as I was aware, wasn't really present at that time. You know, it was mostly just battle music or, you know, dance beats for driving games, you know. Um, there wasn't melancholic tunes. There wasn't tunes yeah. about being lonely or being sad or, you know, falling in love. There was none of that. And I just felt it could work. It yeah. could work with Lara because she had that, I know, that sort of character. Um and I thought, you know, well, look, gamers like movies. And there's loads of emotional content in movies. Yeah, why, why not put it in games? Why not? So I was sort of writing stuff that I wanted to hear, which I thought Lara might be feeling. And then I would try and find a place in the game where it made sense to play it. I was sort of working like that. It was very experimental, I suppose. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't designing, I didn't design the soundtrack and then go away and write yeah, it. Yeah. It wasn't like that at all. It was like, okay, let's write a tune, and then let's see if I can mm. see if I can make it work. Yeah, no, fair see enough. If I can make it sit in the game somewhere. And sometimes I'd write a tune for three minutes, going there nah, too long. And I'd chop it in half and use it in two different places and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was quite experimental. No, yeah, good. Um, have you seen or, or played any of the future Tomb Raider games, and even the movies? And what do you think about their soundtracks and? Does it, does it not great, oh, I don't think great's the right word, but does it, would you, do you feel a bit funny about seeing other people making music for the future Tomb Raider games? Well, <clears throat> not really, not in that sense, because, you know, after doing three of them, I, I wanted to do something else. Oh, fair enough. I sort of had enough, I, I wanted, I'd, I'd almost, I'd almost in fact had enough games industry at that point. I wanted to just do other things, yeah. film, TV, music industry, you know, I just, yeah, I sort of had enough being a core design. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Six years there, I think it's enough for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, when, when the other guys, you know, I interviewed Pete to sort of take over from me. So, you know, he got on and did four, five, and six. I, do you know, I, I barely... I, I, I barely got engaged with those games at the time. Yeah, I did. I did play them later on, but much later on. Um, <clears throat> but while they were being made, I didn't really, you know, I didn't go back to core design very much. And and I moved uh, down to Oxfordshire, so I was a long way away from Derby. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I was just sort of disconnected from it already. So it didn't bother me at all. Fair enough. I think the first time I sort of became sort of really interested in Tomb Raider again was when uh, Crystal did the anniversary. Well, in fact, when Core was doing the anniversary, they called me and said, would I be interested in doing the music? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, But then the project was taken away and moved over to Crystal Dynamics. And then I didn't hear anything again until the game was released. And then it was, oh, you know, let me have a listen to this. This is an anniversary version. Um, So I listened to all the Trolls music. And that was really, that was fascinating. Huh? Just yeah, just hearing what you know his take on it, you know his interpretation of, of those tunes. Um, I'm sure I would have done it differently, you know, different yeah. writers write differently. That's his style. I'm a different style. Um, I didn't think it was 
I didn't think it was wrong for the game or anything like that. I thought it worked quite well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and then I, I guess that sort of rekindled my interest, and I started buying all the previous games, and yeah, and started listening to Legend and Underworld stuff, and yeah. Um, so no, it hasn't, it hasn't bothered me. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't make me upset or anything. Uh, just interested, I think, more than anything. That's good. Good answer. Good answer. Um, we just like Tomb Raider. We love Silent Hill at Arcade Attack, and uh, you you worked on Downpour. Is that right? Yeah, I was the audio director. I mean, what was that like? I mean, obviously, Silent Hill was a huge franchise, huge one of the biggest sort of horror games. Did you? How did that opportunity occur? And was there a bit of pressure on you to, uh, to deliver on Downpour? So, how did I get that? So, I was working for Zoe Mode in Brighton yep. in 2010. Well, I started there in 2008. And in 2010, there was uh, um, there was an opportunity to go to um, Bruno to help Vatra Games. Um, they were making a game called Russian Attack. It's an old... Konami coin up game, and they were converting that to the PS3, I think. Yeah. Um, not writing that for PS3. Um, but they only had one junior sound designer, and it was struggling from an audio perspective. Uh, I was audio manager back at Zoe Mode, I had a director above me. But he said to me, look, you know, these guys could really do with our help. It was like a sister company. We were both owned by Kuji. Yeah. So he said, look, they could really do with some help. Do you want to go out there for three months? And I was like, yeah, sure. Great. Go to another country for three months. You know, so, good good, yeah. so I popped over there, um, started working on that. And I, I knew that they were also working on Silent Hill. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit of a carrot. I wanted to kind of see what was going on there. Um, but for those three months, I was really just focused on Russian attack. Yeah. Um, but during that time, I really got to like Bruno and the people there. And I negotiated with the boss at Vatra. I said, look, you know, if I came over here, would you be interested in taking me on full time? He was like, yeah, of course. Nice. So I was like, great. So I said, can you make me audio director? And he went, yes. <laughs> so I was like, okay, great. For Silent Hill? He went, yeah, of course. So that was it. I went back to England. I quit. Six weeks later, I went back to Bruno. Uh, Russian Attack was finished by then. So then I was that audio director on Silent Hill. Now that had been going, I think, for about a year and a half already. So it was quite a way through the project, um, but it was another two years before we finished it. Two years, wow. So the whole project, I think, was going for about three and a half years. Okay. So, um, so was there a lot of pressure on me? Well, you know, there was a lot wrong with the game, but I knew straight away what was wrong with it from an audio point of view. Yeah. So I knew what to do. I knew what to do to fix it. I just needed the people because I only had one junior, a, a Batra and me. And, you know, you can't deliver a AAA game with, with that uh, size audio team. You need a bigger team. So I hired in people that I'd worked with before. I ended up with a team of eight people plus the composer. It was... Uh, Daniel Licht, he yep. was out in Hollywood. So, yeah, I just had to sort of, I just assigned different sections of the sound to each person. So one guy was doing the impact table, another guy was doing footsteps, another guy was doing weapons. You know, yeah. you just divide it up like that. And, um, yeah, you just got to keep track of it all in a big spreadsheet, make sure everyone's delivering on time to quality. and You know, and then, my junior guy, who was in Bruno with me, um, he was doing most of the implementation, well, him and me, yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. So, yeah, two years of just 
living inside a spreadsheet. That's what it was like. I mean, <laughs> a good a good two years or. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely fine, mate. I, I really enjoyed it. It's stressful towards the end, but it usually yeah. is on big projects like that. I mean, that was a huge project. It goes towards the end and things aren't working and, you know, clock's ticking. And, yeah. you know, everyone has to start working late nights and weekends and stuff. Yeah, it does get stressful. Yeah. Um, and people don't like it. Um, but, you know, I was... I was going through a divorce at the time, actually, from my first wife in England. So I was sort of on my own in Bruno. So, you know, working late nights and weekends for me, again, it was like going back to core design. Yeah. You know, I didn't have um, a life outside of work. So it was fine. I just I just worked night and day on that. And, um, yeah, had some scary nights, I tell you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like bloody it. designers, you know, you think you know where the monsters are, and the designers have decided to change where it was, yeah, you know, yeah, where yeah. the trigger point was. You're like, I'm sure there was some monster there. And it's like, Whoa, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. So, yeah, you know, when you're working on that at three o'clock in the morning with a pair of headphones on in a dark room, wow, it gets pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> are you a fan of those kind of games like Silent Hills? And yeah, no, I, 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 I like. I do like horror stuff. Yeah. I like horror movies. Um, um, you know, you, you can't really enjoy silent, uh, you know, a game like Silent Hill when you're working on it. Yeah, you can't really enjoy it because you you know, you know all the bad points. You know, you know what happens. You know, you know what happens before it happens mm-hmm. because you have you have to be told about it in order to design the sound to work. Yeah. So, you know, it's like somebody reading the end of the book before you've even started. Uh, might ruin the plot a bit, I suppose. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah you know. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's still it's still really enjoyable from, you know, the point of view of trying to create a frightening atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, you know, we know where the scare points are. So it's, it's trying to build up the tension to that scare point. And that can be quite difficult in a in an open world because you don't know when the player is going to mm. you know hit that trigger or whatever so trying to sort of build tension up to a certain trigger point is actually quite tricky yeah lots of interactive sounds that just gradually layer on top of each other you know to increase that sort of um to, to, to increase the tension you know yeah. um and then at the pinnacle moment, yeah, there's various things we do to enhance the scare, to make it work. And uh, yeah, a lot of trial and error. Um, Good stuff. And, and, and it's a lot. It's, it's a lot to do with timing with horror games. Yeah. yeah I mean, and, that, and that's like I say, that, that's when it's difficult when. You know, the player can just stop walking if they want to. It's like, oh, shit, hang on a minute. <laughs> Keep walking. Well, yeah, so you, you couple more steps, yeah. To, all, to control the audio. Yeah. You know, if they, it, 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 it's things like, you know, if they stop moving, you start and turn everything down in volume. What? Yeah. Just the simplest of tricks like that. And, and suddenly, the player is, like, really unnerved because... Why, why, why can't I hear anything? No, no, I don't. And then suddenly you drop something on them, you know. I mean, but you need those moments of silence before the scare and timing that, getting that right is, yeah, quite tricky. Yeah, wow. I mean, it sounds much more difficult than a movie, for example, because you've got a bit of control when people watch the movie. Definitely. You know, a movie is kind of easy in comparison yeah. because you know exactly when everything is going to happen. Yeah. So you can you can plan it, you can build it, and you know, and you can build it to work every single time because yeah. it will always be the same. But it's not always the same in a game, and it, and that makes it much much more. Wow, you yeah, haven't really thought about it before, but yeah, I, I totally get it now. Yeah, um, probably the complete opposite of Silent Hill is the Spice Girls. <laughs> is it true yeah. that is it true that you worked with the Spice Girls on a game before? Is that right? Well, it wasn't a game. Um, oh, okay. So after I left. Core yeah. in ninety eight. In nineteen ninety nine, I got a phone call from the lighting director of 
uh, who, who works for the Spice Girls. Yeah. Uh, a guy called Peter Barnes. And he called me and he said, we're putting on, we're doing another Spice Girls show, another tour. It's called Christmas and Spice World. Yeah. And he said, I'm looking for some introductory music to, to bring on the girls, which wow. I'm going to synchronize my lighting display to. And he said, I'd, I'd like to use the Tomb Raider 2 theme and the Skidoo. Wow. And I was like, ah, you know, thinking in the back of my head that, you know, I don't own that music. I doesn't core design own it. So I was thinking, and then I said to him, ah, you don't want to use that. You are, you know, I, I should write something new for you in yeah. the style of Tomb Raider. So that way we can put your Spice Girls tune in there or something, some little signature tune. And we can tailor it specifically, you know, to the Spice Girls. I said, surely that's a better thing to do. <laughs> that's a clever answer. And he's like, yeah, so yeah, I really like the sound of that. I said, great. I said, I can do it in, a, you know, exactly the same way. I said, it'll sound like two made two theme, and it'll be like this to do, <laughs> but it won't be. Yeah. So yeah, he went for it. So I spent actually I spent two weeks writing that, and it's three and a half minutes. Oh, so wow. there you go. You know, when you when you <laughs> When you when you have to pull out all the stops, you know, and everything has to be tickety boo, yeah, you spend a lot of time polishing it. Oh, nice. Um, so after I think the first week, he drove up to where I was living in Lincolnshire, and he spent a day with me, just uh, you know, as a director, just um, you know, telling me. He wanted a little bit more tension here, or he wanted you know a little bit more of an explosion here, you know. So we were making notes and changing things while he was there, and then he went away, and I spent another week um, just sort of implementing those changes and polishing it. Sent him down the final draft. The girls had a listen to it. We got a green light. Yeah, and that was it. And then he scripted his laser light show to it, and um, yeah. A few weeks later, I got my VIP ticket, went down to Earl's Court Stadium and stood there at the front with 20,000 screaming girls. <laughs> I mean, did you did you work with the girls themselves? Did you actually get to talk to them or meet them properly? Uh, not during the development of the track. Um, it was basically going to... Um, uh, I can't remember the name of that. Jer- is it Jerry, the one with the big black frizzy hair? You might be right, yeah. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I can't remember now. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's Scary Spice, isn't it, actually, I think? Scary so. Spice. Exactly. Yeah. Scary Spice. She she was the one that was um, mostly providing feedback on the tune that I was writing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then when we went down to the show, because um, we had VIP tickets, we were, you know, we were invited to the after, after show party. Yeah. So I went in there and I met um, Baby Spice and and uh, Posh Victoria. Yeah. Um, and David was there as well. Wow. Oh, Dave. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh really, son? Oh, really? <laughs> you know, uh, you, you know <laughs> I mean, it's quite a surreal sort of moment. I bet it was. You know, yeah. In those sort of places, and they're there. And there were, you know, obviously some Spice Girl fans there, you know, getting autographs and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I just said hello to them and just said, you know, I, would, I wrote your intro music. Oh, wow, well, it was great. Thanks. <laughs> and then that's it. Yeah. That's all you get. That good stuff. I bet it's one of those days you're always going to remember, aren't you? You're not going to forget that day anytime soon. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. And, and little moments like that. Um, yeah. Well, it really makes it all worthwhile. You never know, Nathan. They're, they're back on tour soon, so you might get a phone call. You know. So I hear. So <laughs> I hear. Yeah. Oh dear. Look, we'll go back to video games if that's all right. We, 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 yeah. quick, a few quick fire questions. I know you're a busy man. In, Nathan, was there ever a piece of music that you ever worked on that you weren't quite happy about? You never felt really fully motivated for, and um, and if so, which game and music was this for? <clears throat> yeah. So I think Battle Engine: The Killer. Um, yeah. For Lost Toys, it was difficult. The, the the guy I was working for, a guy called Jeremy Longley, um, he'd listened to some of my previous music, Tomb Raider, particularly the Soul Star, and he wanted something similar. And I wasn't too chuffed about that because it meant writing something that I'd already written. And it's difficult to get motivation to do that 
or at least I, I found it for that particular project. So the first sort of two or three tunes, I wasn't really enjoying it. And I think, I don't know, it, it maybe shows in those tunes. If you know me well enough, you might be able to spot that I wasn't having a good time. <laughs> but enough. then I sort of got into it. You know, I got I got the instrumentation sorted out and things started to settle down and and then I started to enjoy it a bit more. And I think the sort of remaining seven or eight tunes um, were much better. Um, yeah, you know, I think when it, when you have to be careful how you feel when you're writing music because mm-hmm. it's easily it's easily shown in what you're doing, you know. Um, you know, if you're, if you're upset about something mm. or, you know, somebody hasn't paid you for six months, you know, <laughs> or something <laughs> like this, you know, and, you're, you know, it can, it can seriously affect your mood. Yeah. And that does affect, you know, what you're putting down, what you're writing. So you really do have to some, you have to sort of learn to switch off from what's going on outside of the studio, just yeah, lock yourself away into into the mood that you need to be in for that particular project. Um, yeah, so I think Battle Engine Killer was yeah a bit of a struggle at the beginning. Because well, no, I, I like your honesty. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm I'm pretty certain you listen to other video game music. Is there any other particular game? That you or that you played before. This is un- unbelievable. This music, this soundtrack is out of this world. Is there one yeah. game that's really blown you away? Yeah, um, Medal of Honor. To yeah. Me, yeah, was just fantastic. Um, yeah, Michael Giacchino. I'm not sure how he pronounced his name. Giacchino. Um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant score. There's not a note wrong in it. It just comes in at the right time it's a perfect mood it's brilliant um brilliant theme that keeps reoccurring yeah it's just all gels together so so well yeah that's good um, there's another game um called homeworld by sierra it was a little bit before medal of honor i, I like that because Again, it fitted the game really well. You know, you, you're sort of suspended in space with your army. Yeah. Um, it's a real-time strategy. Um, but the, the the visual space you get is massive, and the music really fits that. It's really ambient. It doesn't, it doesn't really have a tune. It's more just like a sound than mm. anything. Um, and that just seemed to fit the emptiness of space really well. I thought it was good writing. Um, yeah, so I, I enjoyed that really atmospheric. Good stuff. Um, do you have any quick advice for anyone that might want to get into the video game industry or music industry or you know, or both like yourself? Is there any, what would you say to anyone thinking about looking to get into that industry? Don't do it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's my quick answer. Yeah. Um, you know, I think if you do want to go into games or, or anything creative, it's not so much what you know, but who you know. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of competition out there. There's lots of people that want my job or, and there's lots of other people that I wish I had their job. Yeah. You know, um, but there's not the same turnaround of staff in, in, in audio particularly. You know, you might have a, a company of 60 people and two people doing audio. Yeah. So, you know, and those guys know they're in a good job. They love it. They're not about to leave. Mm. So there aren't many opportunities that come up. And when they do, there's a lot of people going for it. So the competition is difficult. Mm. <laughs> My recommendation is to get to know people, you know, go to the game shows, try and meet people through people you know, try and get to know some producers. Yeah. Producers are good people. Um, they're good people to know. Um, and game designers, you know, if you're getting with those people, 
they're the people that often request or hire audio people. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got a good producer friend, you know, and you just keep keep taking them out for beer and pizza. <laughs> and, and then hopefully the next game they write, you know, you're on, you, you, you got to keep calling these people. Yeah. Keep reminding them that you exist. And then the moment when they go, oh, yeah, we need some music. Oh, well, my mate Billy just called me yesterday. He can do it. Mm. And it's that. And if you didn't call him yesterday, you'd think of somebody else. Mm. So you you have to just just you know not so frequently that it pisses them off. You know, it's a delicate game. Of course. But you have to you have to just keep in people's minds somehow. Um, and and I think you know having friends recommend you is also key. Mm. Getting in with a company. You know, I, th- I think you've got to be prepared to work for nothing to begin with, as like an apprenticeship or something like that. Yeah. I think that's a good good thing to do. You know, if you can get a placement with a games company in a sandwich year at uni or something like that, that's a, that's a good way forward. Because often a sandwich university course, you know, you go out and you work for a company for a year in your third year. Yeah. Come back and do your final year exams. Usually that company, if you if you've been good, and you've done a good job there, usually that company will take you back again. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably the, the best way in. Um, that sounds good to me. And, and you know, be prepared to do other work as well. And, yeah. I, and when I mean other work, I mean like anything, like working in a bar, painting people's houses, anything. Anything that keeps the money coming in to fuel your habit of being creative. Good. And don't give up. Keep, keep, keep going. Keep going. No, Nathan, I really appreciate that. And it's, uh, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like advice that you've probably done for yourself. Is that fair? You, that's the way you kind of done things. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I still do it. You yeah. know, there's still periods when I don't have any work and I have to go out and find it. Yeah. And the first place I go to is my friends. Yeah. And the first people I contact and say, do you know anyone? Do you know anyone that's, that needs some audio at the minute? You know? Um, I, I think, you know, cold, cold calling a company to say to them, can I write some music for a game? I think is just almost zero chance of success. Yeah. They, they, they're just not going to do it. They know somebody that they use for music. They've got a mate of a mate, you know, they always get in mm-hmm. now or whatever. Or they hire somebody because they've got lots of money and they hire somebody that um, you know, already has a track record of 20 years experience or something like that. Yeah. You know, they're not going to hire a nobody fresh out of college just because no, he comes in on the door. Yeah, it's you know, too much of a gamble, but, isn't it? For one thing, yeah. You know, well, you know, who in their right mind is going to risk a AAA project on somebody like that? You just, you're just yeah. not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. No, no, Nathan, good advice. I really appreciate that. Um, have you? Have you played every video game you've ever created music for? Because you've got an impressive library of games. But have you actually sat down and played every single game properly in your own personal time? And do you have a personal favourite game out of all the ones you've worked on? No, I don't. I don't think I've played any game that I've worked on from start to finish. I don't think I've ever done that. But okay. It doesn't. It doesn't work like that. Mm. We haven't got time to do that. Um. You know, you, when you start working on a game, there's some brief, there's some synopsis of what it is, what happens. Maybe there's a story. Yeah. Um, so what, what I do is I go, I look at the game a little bit just to get a feel for it. And then I go and talk to the people who are working on it, the designers usually. And I'm saying to them, right, how many levels have you got? Yeah. What happens? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and then you, you know, again, from the designers, I will want to know, uh, are there different, well, first of all, does the character have footsteps? Yes. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Are there there different surfaces that they walk on? Yes or no? Um, 
you know, how many different surfaces? Do they have different kinds of shoes? Okay, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to build up my impact matrix, which is basically source material, impact material. Yeah. Okay, so shoes on wood, shoes on concrete, shoes on ice, shoes on snow, bare feet on concrete, bare feet on wood, bare yeah. feet on ice. Wow. You build up a massive matrix, and then that tells you all the sounds that you need to make for the footsteps. Yeah. So you've got character footsteps, then you've got monster footsteps. <laughs> um, and then you've got what, what you know, can, can you drop things? Can you pick up things and drop things? Hmm. What objects can we drop? What surfaces can they fall on? And then you've got another matrix table. And then you've got another table for weapons. What weapons have they got? What do they fire? Is there a reload? What happens when it's empty? You know, you, you just start asking questions to the designers. And so eventually you, beat, you piece out, you piece together the categories of sounds that you need and all the combinations thereof. And then you start making it. Now, I, I don't have to go anywhere near the game. Yeah. All of that, I can build all of the sounds. What what usually happens is the developers will give me, or I'll, I'll request a test, a, an audio test level. Yeah. And it's basically like a big hangar or a big sports hall. That's what it looks like. It's a big square room. <laughs> and in that room, I ask them to put all the objects that I can pick up. I asked them to put all the different surface types that I can walk on. I asked them to put all the different surface types on the walls I can hit with a bullet. Okay? So we put all these surfaces in one room. It looks like a big mosaic by the time you finish yeah. adding anything. All right? And then you can go and walk on ice, concrete, stone, gravel, grass, all in a straight line, two or three steps on each one. And, of course, you can test it like this. So you can test yeah. The sound, the matrix. So I spend most of the game development in that test arena. That's a, that's and it's a only real... when I've got everything working in the test arena, and this includes like occlusion zones, reverb settings, yeah. all sorts of stuff. Um, when everything's sort of in that test environment working, then you can start to look at the game and go, okay, how is this working in the game? How are, you know, are there any problems? You know, yeah. um, and then you can start sort of testing it, really. Um, so I don't really play the games like that. You know, we have lots of cheat codes that enable us to sort of yeah. fly. We can fly Lara around the Tomb Raider level. You can fly her really fast, you yeah. know, and then just drop her in a place, and then the game kicks in as if you walked through the whole level, you know, yeah. as a rock user. So we've got things like that. We have God mode where she can't die, you know, invincibility, you know, and all those kind of things, which help us get to a certain place in the game to test the particular area that we're working on. So I don't often really play the game sequentially yeah. as, as a user. Um, I just go to places where I need to um, provide audio for and, and just work at it bit by bit by bit, like a big jigsaw. I mean that's amazing. I, that's a great answer. I mean, it's. It, it, I think we sometimes. Uh, well, I personally, you know, I, I love music and games, but I always take for granted almost. But all these little things you're saying now is so much in the background. It's absolutely incredible. Oh, it's loads, man. You know, it's, yeah. it's been likened to building a Formula One racing car. Yeah. Uh, there's well over a million parts. You know, and yeah. It, 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 it always amazes me, actually. It's the programming team that amazes me, how they piece it all together. Yeah. It's just phenomenal. Because um, there, there is so much data, so many things, you know, millions of calculations per second, oh, yeah. working everything out. You know, it's just amazing how the bloody things work. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> a, bit of a bit of a random question, but obviously you're a musician. You, you like your music. Is there any particular bands that you love listening to and... Would you would you say these bands help aspire your work in gaming, or is it completely separate? You know, every, every now and again, I find something new, uh, some new band that really uh, interests me. But um, I guess particular favourites. I mean, if I go back to my youth, you know, I grew up with the Police, yep. so yep. you know, I'm still a big fan of them, and, and I know every single track they've ever written. Um, but I like. 
lots of other bands. I, I like Coldplay. I yep. listen to a lot of Coldplay. Yep. Um, I like Pink Floyd. I think they're, you know, great, really experimental and still good today. Um, I, I like so much stuff. I, I like loads of heavy rock, Def Leppard, I love yeah. Boston. A, bit, a bit, little bit sounding a bit old school. <laughs> but, you know, I do listen to the modern stuff. I have the radio one in the car every day, so, you know, I listen to all the modern pop music as well. Some of it's interesting. Mm. It's, you know, same old, same old. Mm. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm usually fascinated when I hear a good singer. You know, I like Queen because mm. of Freddie Mercury. Yeah. He's an amazing singer. And, and Carl Play, you know, he's he's got a great voice as well. Keen, I like Keen. I think he's got a good voice. Yeah. So, yeah, I tend to sort of... Um, and Sting, of course, from the police. Cool. You know, uh, Phil Collins, I think he's brilliant. Um, no, some proper good artists there. I can't deny that. So, good taste. Good taste. Yeah, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's millions of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, penultimate question, just before you sort of say goodbye... I don't know if you can tell us really, but I'll ask it anyway. Is there any what projects and games that you're currently working on? Well, at the moment, I'm 100 percent on the Tomb Raider suite. Um, I have been for about two years yeah. now. The, the project itself has been going for at least four, um, but the last two years, yeah, I, I've, I've just been doing that and nothing else. I had to, um, I had to sort of bring in. Um, an audio manager for some of my game projects this last year because I, I just couldn't yeah I couldn't up with it. So he kind of took took care of those for me and we sort of hired in freelancers to do the work. Um and he managed it. Um but you know I I just haven't been looking for other games work and usually if you don't look for it you, you don't get it. Yeah, yeah. And, but, it, you know, it's not a problem because I'm, like I say, I'm, I'm too busy anyway with the Zoom Rain this week. There's lots of other things I, I, I've I got plans for and that I will be doing after we've got this sort of Kickstarter out of the way. Um, you know, I want to look a lot of, I want to look at a lot of my um, older game soundtracks and yeah. do not necessarily, you know, a full orchestral thing with them, um, but something similar, similar kind of project to what I've done with the Tomb Raider Suite, but with my other game soundtracks. I think there's some good music there. And, um, yeah, tough. so hopefully there'll be enough work to keep me busy till the day I die. <laughs> what, how can our uh, listeners get involved in the Tomb, tomb uh, Raider Suite? Is, it, is, is there a website you can put point in the right direction? Or? Yeah, so you can go to tombraidersuite.com. Yeah. Um, we are also on Facebook. We have Two Made a Sweet on Facebook. We're on Instagram, also Two Made a Sweet. Uh, Twitter as TR Sweet Official. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, or you can even follow the project on Kickstarter. Yeah, um, yeah. And you can get all our updates from there. Um... Yeah, there, there's there's information on our website about um, live shows that we've got coming up. Um, you know, obviously, yeah. there's our stuff on there where you can get the albums, you can get CDs, vinyls, digital downloads. We've got T-shirts, and of stuff, posters and things. We're going to be adding some more merchandise to that soon. Nice. Um, yeah, and we're we're asking people that have come to the concerts to to send us an email and, and tell us, you know, their memoirs about concerts and how, you know, whether they like them or not or whatever. And we plan to put those up on the website as well, photographs and stuff. So, yeah, we're trying to, trying to, you know, keep people interested and keep the, keep the project fresh with mm. new stuff happening. You know, I don't, I don't just want to make the album and then, you know, leave it alone. Yeah, make you know, it. I want to keep doing the concerts. I want to keep, um, you know, we, w- we want to be releasing uh, the remastered soundtracks from Tomb Raider 1, 2, and 3. We want to be doing the synth versions of the Tomb Raider suite as well. 
Yeah. So at least another four albums there that um, are sort of part of this. And then, of course, there's a documentary which we're making. That's started production now. We, we've started logging all the video rushes that we've got over yeah. the last two years. And, uh, yeah, we'll be piecing that together uh, over the next couple of months. So, yeah, that, that, that's a lot of work as well. So, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, wh- whenever there's a live show, I make myself available to go there and, you know, meet with the VIPs and do a yeah. little thank you speech and stuff. So, yeah, I'll be touring a little bit more next year. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you know, lots of things. It's oh, quite yeah. surprising, really, how, how much there is to do. And apart from all of that, we've got a shop to maintain. Now, somebody has to be the shopkeeper. <laughs> um, at the moment, that's me. <laughs> so, no, good on you, yeah. Nathan. You're a busy man, and you, you, you're keeping yourself busy, and it sounds like really exciting times ahead. I'm, I'm, you know, good on you. Good on you. Yeah, uh, I'm enjoying it. You know, it, yeah. it's kind of what I've always wanted to do, really. Yeah. I've just always wanted to write music and, and earn a living from it. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, there, there's always that chance that you get, you know, the big pot of gold. But, you know, that's not really my main yeah. ambition behind it, really. It, yeah. It's just, uh, just to have a, a, a comfortable life and... Not have to worry about paying my mortgage next month, you know. It's yeah, really fun. down to that. And, <laughs> and if, if I could do that right in music, great, job done. Good on you. Look, Nathan, I've, I've got one final question, and, and I really do appreciate your time today. And I have to tell you, actually, the the answer we get the most, I ask this question to everyone I, I, I interview, is, is actually the answer is Lara Croft. So the pressure is on you to answer with a different character, okay? So if you could go for a drink with any video game character, who would you choose and why? And I, I've already told you, Lara Croft is by far the biggest choice. <laughs> yeah, you know when I, uh, yeah, because when, when I, when you sent me the question through, <laughs> yeah, I got to that one. I thought, ah, oh, it's a difficult question. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, actually, no, it's really easy. Of course, it would be Lara Croft. Yeah, why not? You know, why wouldn't you want to go to have a drink with Lara Croft? Well, of course. So that was going to be my answer. <laughs> Sorry, Nathan, <laughs> but, but I. I have been thinking about other game characters. I, th- I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> it's a tough one. I think I'd probably have to choose a female. Yeah. But I don't know that many female game characters. No, on on the spot, all I can think of is Laura Croft, truthfully. Right, if you. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, I go, I go, I go out for a drink with uh, the girl out of Resident Evil. She's oh, okay. Pretty, pretty nice. Yeah, um, my fellow yeah. Arcade Attack, Keith and Dylan, are probably shouting the name right now. I'm I'm not the huge biggest Resident Evil fan, but they're shouting the name right now. But I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she she she's she's quite cool. Yeah, so yeah, I'll have a drink with her. Look, Nathan, you've been a, a real gentleman. It's been so interesting learning about your career and just video game music in general. You know, so much interesting stuff there. So thank you so much. I do appreciate. You're it. welcome. You're welcome. No, it's been good talking. There's been some good questions. Good stuff. Thanks for listening to 